Hey everybody, I'm Steve. Um, I'm going to present some work that Uwe and Rebecca and Sam and Kate and I did back way many moons ago before COVID when everything was different. Um, but before, before I do, um, I want to talk a little bit more about what behavioural economics is or, you know, kids often ask when um, I do a bit of promotion of BE at schools and they say, what is an economist? It's more, you know, econ being an economist is more a way of thinking and about approaching um, an understanding of how people behave. Here's three projects that we did. One with Dick Marley's team in biomaterials at Ibi, um, looking at how surgeons and nurses and patients go through a process of um, undergoing mastectomy and reconstruction. Because Dick Marley's working on um, biomaterials alternatives for um, silicon and saline implants. Um, that was in the British Journal of Surgery. Here's a paper in PNAS with um, Benno and Ben looking at sexual plasticity in um, bisexual populations, so how males and females differ in relation to identification as being bisexual. And here's another paper we looked at, we used um, in social psychology and personality science, looking at how personality characteristics influence regulatory behaviour during COVID. So in lockdowns, do different personality types impact um, you know, non-compliance with regulatory behaviour. Being an economist or being a behavioural economist allows you to go out and poke your finger at all sorts of different um, forms of human behaviour. And the ag space is something that um, is definitely a place that we've dabbled before. Um, and from an economics perspective, you know, understanding regulation and compliance is sort of a fundamental of neoclassical economics. But the behaviour side, I think, is what's super interesting for you guys and super interesting for us, you know, incorporating things like cognition, uh, personality, emotion. These are really big things for um, any, particularly any new tech. So here was the project. Um, basically, we worked with Derm before Derm changed its name. Um, and we had um, a couple of contacts that were really passionate about doing BE research. Unfortunately, across the COVID process, those people moved on to other um, employment inside the state government. So we've sort of lost the contacts, but the projects that we worked with, this preliminary project looked at unintentional non-compliance. Uh, and I was told that um, after our report came out, um, it improved unintentional non-compliance by more than 40%. And then the marketing um, arm of Derm actually gave 20 million to a Victorian um, company to do their marketing, which we could have done. We could have had 20 million. Um, but I think it's really interesting that, that they they took our science um, and then applied it. So what did we do? We had a program of research that designed and developed interventions and key messages, activities and tools for encouraging uh, water compliance. And what we were super interested in was this unintentional non-compliance. You know, um, deliberately not complying with something is very obvious, you know. Um, intentional behaviour and repeated intentional behaviour. But what's interesting is, is when people don't intend not to comply. Now, what's an example of that? I'm going to give you a cognitive error or a cognitive bias. Um, and I'll show you what we do. Um, we ask, this is one of the questions that we regularly ask people in our surveys. Um, Jonathan's an ex-professional football player for Queensland. After he finished playing professionally, Jonathan became a PE teacher at a local high school. Jonathan has two sons, both of whom are excellent athletes. So here's, here's two outcomes, uh, here's two questions. Yeah, which is more likely? Jonathan coaches a local junior football team or Jonathan coaches a local junior football team and plays a little bit of seniors football with the local pub team? The economists in the room can't answer, but everybody else, tell me, which one do they think is more likely? Is it A or is it B? You put your hand up for both. I'm just <laughs> wanting. Um, and for the guys online too, yeah, pick something, A or B. Um, what's the question asking us? Yeah, I know that's Jonathan Thurston. He played for Queensland. He's a great bloke. I'd love to meet him at the pub. That's all peripheral noise. The question's asking us about what is more likely. It's got nothing to do with Jonathan. It's asking about probability. So let's say for argument's sake with this first question, the probability is somewhere between zero and one, yeah, and we'll say it's flip of a coin 50-50, there's one outcome here. In the second question, there's two outcomes. Jonathan plays, um, coaches the team, and he also plays for the pub team. So you know if you multiply two decimals together, um, the probability must be smaller, yeah? Two outcomes here, one outcome here. But often when we make decisions or make choices in everyday life, if you think, you know, human beings make tens of thousands of decisions every day, 
but our brain, just from a caloric perspective, can't you know, sustain the ability to make so many decisions. So we take these shortcuts, these heuristics. Um, and this is an example here. We've seen Jonathan. We know he's a great bloke. He's got 4X on his, you know, and we've, and we've taken the shortcut on the first one. And this is the example we use for um, one of these projects when we talked with um, Queensland cane growers and irrigators. Um, we did a, a literature review, had some design principles, and I think one of the great things about working in BEST is working with Rebecca Russell Bennett, who is a social marketer, and marketers and economists love to go at each other because we employ quality, econs employ quantitative methods where um, social marketers are more qualitative, is that we have this more holistic understanding and method, methodology um, when we approach these sorts of problems. Now, we went out to Western Queensland and we did all of these um, surveys in these regional areas. We went all up the East Coast. It was great fun. There was almost a car accident where a tractor ran over us. Um, it was one of the best data captures I've ever been part of. And what we did was we did these two different things. We did these qualitative co-design workshops and then we built these personas in relation to some uniform or overlapping behaviours that we saw in relation to the farmers and the irrigators. And then what we did was we built um, a simulation, uh, a farming simulation in the lab, and we got people in to do, uh, we asked the farmers to run through this simulation as if they were uh, making decisions about their water compliance on a weekly basis for, uh, on a monthly basis for eight months. Um, here's the personas that, um, that Rebecca and, and Kate came up with, um, some key behaviours, um, identifications, and here's some of these interventions. So this is the first one. Sam talked about it before, in that farming communities have much stronger peer effects. Um, smaller communities, regional areas, um, again, I could give you the evolutionary argument behind it, but more codependence on uniform behaviours. Um, so one of the interventions we had from when we designed had the co-design workshops was a peer effect. And what we introduced was basically here, um, here's our eight iterations of, hey, what's going on in your farm? <clears throat> How much water do you want to use for your crops? And we gave everyone homogenous outcomes for what was happening environmentally, ecologically. So everyone was uniform. And what we played with was we told them in this scenario, um, your neighbour plans to underuse water versus what the baseline is. And we, we're, we're trying to, um, have an experimental treatment effect to see whether or not this peer effect works and influences behaviour. The blue line is the treatment and the red line is the baseline. Again, very small samples because it's hard to work in regional areas with farmers, as Sam um, said. Um, but what we see almost uniformly is that when I tell farmers, your neighbour is using less water, you use less water which is a huge effect. That's, that's a really good way to, like Sam was saying, frame uh, an, uh, a mechanism for change in behaviour. My uh, y-axis is the volumetric amount of water used. So we can see across the time the blue, arguably the blue line, I know the confidence intervals overlap, but don't worry about the statistics here. Yeah? <laughs> um, and here's another example in relation to the flip in relation to economic benefit. So we told the farmers, um, Red is our baseline, and then for the blue farmers, we told them that next season, your crop is gonna be valued at more. So should you use more water? Because then you'll generate more, more crop, then you'll make more money. And guess what we see is that the blue line goes up and the red one sort of stays stable. Again, these are understanding, um, you know, very small, scalable behavioral interventions can have huge impacts on behaviour. Um, and like Sam was talking about, if we're talking about you know, 500, 600, 1,000 hectare properties, you know, one small amount of decision in relation to water consumption or water reporting has huge effects across um, the state. So yeah, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of, of how the methods that we use or, if, or that we can apply. Um, this is just one project. Like I said before, uh, the last four years, Uber and I have been working a lot with Dipma on technology adoption. Um, I think Uber presented to you guys some of our biomaterials research looking at the breast reconstruction um, research. But yeah, this is um, some of the core team in BEST. Um, yeah, thanks everybody. Any questions? Oh, then we go straight through. Yeah.